Matthew 17, verses 14 to 27. And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly, for often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? He said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the tax? He said, Yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said, From others, Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook, and take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you'll find a shekel. Take that and give it to them, for me and for yourself. So last week we were at a, at a high point in Matthew, uh, literally on a high point, but also theologically speaking. So if you missed last week, the passage just before this one is that tremendous passage uh, telling us the story of the transfiguration of Jesus, that moment where the veil was lifted, where we got to see the divine, eternal Son of God shining through the person of Jesus Christ. So we're seeing Jesus as Son of God in that moment. And then there's that voice that comes out of the clouds saying, this is a confirmation, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, listen to Him. And that really is a theological high point in Matthew's gospel, tying together so much of what he's been wanting us to see, that there's more to Jesus, that he is in fact the Son of God. So that's a theological high point. It's also a literal high point because it takes place on a very high mountain. But it turns out you can't live on a mountain forever. As much as Peter wanted to, remember that from last week, at some point you got to come down the mountain. And so in this story today, they come down the mountain. Again, both literally walk down the mountain, but also theologically theologically speaking, because the scene before us today is if last week was a high point, this is a low point. It's a, it's a downer compared to last. It's a, it's a low point in the faith story of those who have been exposed to the ministry of Jesus. That's coming down the mountain. That's what we're seeing this low point. Then the story moves on. Jesus predicts his death and resurrection for a second time. And then it ends with one of the strangest stories in Matthew, just got to be one of the weirdest ones out there, with the paying of tax, you know, through like a fish that coughs up enough money to pay for the tax. And then, and then it ends chapter 17. And chapter 18, where we get to next week, is the start of the next, the fourth major teaching block of Jesus. So we have these three little stories today, so much to speak about. So without further ado, let's just jump right in. So as they come down the mountain, Jesus, Peter, James, and John, we, we read in the text that there's a great crowd that is gathered at the bottom of the mountain. So something's going on. In the middle of the crowd is the disciples, the remaining nine disciples of Jesus and a father of a small boy. And as they are walking down the mountain, the father rushes to Jesus and pleads with him, Lord, have mercy on my son. 
for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. I mean, let's just pause right there. That is a terrible situation for a father. I can, I can imagine how distressed this father is, whose son has these uncontrollable seizures and he's suffering terribly, and also whose life has been compromised, has been placed in these life-threatening situations by being thrown into fire and into water. So you can imagine the distress of this father. Now we learned that the cause of this particular episode, the seizures in this boy, the cause is demonic because Jesus rebukes the demon from him. And so we're not surprised at that when we realize it's a demon that's causing this. We've traveled through Matthew long enough. We've encountered this before. Whenever the forces of darkness are present, their intention is always to harm. That's what we've seen. But the great end to the story is that Jesus rebukes the demon and the boy was healed instantly. I mean, that's, just, that's a great way to start today is to just reflect on and remember, praise to Jesus Christ who delivers from darkness immediately. Amen? Praise to Him who does. And if there's just people this morning suffering in that way, He is the one. This is His authority over darkness being demonstrated again. But... Let me ask you an important question if you've been with us, especially with Matthew from the start. This little episode of the demonic possession, I mean, as I mentioned, we've, we've heard this story before, right? We've heard this is not the first time that we are being exposed to the fact that Jesus has unrivaled authority over the kingdom of darkness. We've, we've heard the story before, right? Yes, so multiple times, Matthew chapter 8, two demon-possessed men living in tombs. We spend some time dwelling on that story. Matthew chapter nine, a man possessed by a demon who is mute, and in both cases, Jesus delivers them. Matthew chapter 12, a man who's both blind and mute because of his demonic possession gets delivered by Jesus. So the question that I have is, why another story like this? Do we need more evidence of Jesus' authority over darkness? I mean, it can't help to have more, but does Matthew think we need more evidence of Jesus' authority over darkness? No, not, not really. So why another story and why put it here? And the difference between this story and the others we've read so far is that the focus in this particular story is not in fact on Jesus as the miracle worker. The focus in this story is on the disciples who could not do the miracle. So in this one, this is different. The focus here is not so much on Jesus's ability because we've seen that. The focus here is on the disciples' inability. And so the lesson for us today is not so much about the authority of Jesus, although let's just hold on to that. The lesson for us is about what disciples can and should do through their faith in Jesus to bring about deliverance from darkness. Are you with me? That's why we have this story. It's not particularly, I mean, we're keeping in mind the unrivaled authority of Jesus and continue to be amazed. But the point here is on the disciples' inability. And that's where we are going to focus in on this first story, on the ones who should have been able to push back the forces of darkness because they are Jesus' disciples and are acting in faith with him. So let's start there. Let's just start by reflecting on this faith word because that's Matthew's drawing our attention to this aspect of faith again. And you can't miss it in the story. So in the, the first part that we see this is in the response or Jesus' response to the father. So before he heals the son, this is what he says. So the father comes and pleads with him. And Jesus says, O oh, faithless and twisted generation. Not a good description, right? Faithless and twisted generation. How long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Like put up with you. Bring the boy here to me. So what we have here is Jesus, make no mistake, make no mistake. This is Jesus in full prophetic exasperation mode. 
like acting in his role as prophet. Remember, he is a prophet. He's more than a prophet, but not less than a prophet. And echoing the exasperation of prophets in the past who are exasperated at people who still do not believe, who still don't get it, despite the evidence. So that's the mode that Jesus is in, prophetic exasperation. But the question then is, who is Jesus talking to? Right, so the father comes, please help me, my son. And he goes, you faithless and twisted generation. Who's he talking to? Remember the characters in the scene? There's Jesus, there's the disciples, there's the father, and then there's the crowd. Which of those four characters or groups of people is he exasperated with? Who's he talking about? So clearly, at least at least in my mind, I mean, this is not the first time we've heard him refer to a generation and it's never a positive thing. That's quite a general term, right? The generation. And so it seems to me that Jesus is acting like this situation presenting itself is indicative of a larger problem. There's a larger problem around of faithlessness and perversity Another way to translate that word that yeah, is, is twisted. There's a larger problem of faithlessness. Wickedness is the result. And that problem has affected the crowd. And that problem has affected the disciples to some extent too. Are you with me? Faithless and twisted generation. He's saying it generally because it's true, but for sure it has affected the characters to some extent in the story. Now in my mind, I think it would be fair to exactly replicate that statement of Jesus, faithless and twisted generation, to replicate it now for this generation and this time. Don't you think? Just generally speaking, generally speaking, really not talking about anyone in particular, generally speaking, would it be fair to say that this generation, the culture that we live in is a faithless in Jesus and wicked or perverse generation? Is that true? Absolutely, yes. Now, the next question is, does that affect disciples today? Just like it was present then in the time of Jesus and affected the disciples to some extent, affected the crowd, for sure. We live in a similar situation and culture. Can it affect disciples today? You bet. That's part of the warning here, church. We are susceptible to the moral and spiritual values of the generation of the culture around us. And so make no mistake, the faithlessness and general perversity of the world around us can affect and does affect disciples today to some extent where perhaps our trust in God starts to diminish and we end up becoming more twisted. It's true. We are susceptible to the same problem that the disciples were at the bottom of the mountain. So we need to hear this story equally today. And there's a lot to talk about today. Excuse me if I speak on two times speed. But let's not miss this moment. I really don't want us to miss this moment. Because what you can't miss is Jesus' exasperation here. It's just very evident, right? You can't paper over it. How long am I to put up with you? How long? Like he's exasperated. It's very evident. He's not just doing it for show, but this is real. And the sense is that Jesus clearly expects that at some point, Genuine faith kicks in, especially considering all that has been revealed. I mean, that must be what's going through his mind. That despite all he's done, still there's faithlessness. And at some point, he expects genuine faith to kick in. And I know for some people, they struggle with the idea, like a, like a visual imagery here of God and Jesus and God in general having emotions. I know that's like a whole subject on its own and we could talk about it for a long time. I think just to be, to be clear, when we speak of God having emotions, I mean, He does. That does not mean that He is temperamental or unstable or moody, right? But He, he is, of course, the God who is patient, patient in allowing people chance to repent. But while it's true, he's patient. There's a point when the 
time is up. The point will come when the time is up. And so part of, part of the exasperation and the warning for us today, especially for those who have not yet decided on where they are when it comes to Jesus, don't presume upon his patience lasting forever. If you really want to go away and think about that, man, you could have a whale of a time because does his patience last forever? Technically, yes, but there is still a terminus. There is still an end point. Either we die or Christ comes again before we die, but there is an end point. And when that end comes, you do not want to be found faithless and wicked. So there's a point at which that the end comes. And this is Jesus expressing that exasperation. How long am I to be with you? He expects, despite being patient, don't presume upon that. There is an urgency here for the faithless to take up faith and become faithful. So that's the, that's the moment, that's the scene that presents itself when there's the crowd and Jesus heals the boy. And then the scene shifts to a more private moment with Jesus and his disciples, where they ask Jesus, how come they couldn't deliver this boy from his affliction? And Jesus says to them, this is a, a little more tender in this private moment, how come we couldn't do it? And he says, because of your little faith. So he's direct, it's a little more tender, but still direct. You couldn't help because of your little faith. Truly, I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, what mountain? The one you just come down from, the very high one, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. So again, that we're not with the crowd and the boy anymore, we're just with the disciples, but it's the subject of faith. But this time it is not the faithless who are mentioned, it is those of little faith, which is one of Matthew's favorite adjectives when it comes to faith is little faith. Because it's not the first time we've heard that expression, little faith, from the mouth of Jesus, have we? I've heard it a few times before. Let me, let me run you back to hear this phrase. Matthew and Jesus, Matthew's showing us how concerned Jesus is, not just with the faithless, who just refuse to believe, but also the disciples who have little faith. So just rewind, chapter six, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaking about material provision and how much we worry about that. I know I've reminded you of this a few times, but I need the reminder, so I'm sure some of you do too. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is gone, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Chapter eight, the disciples in a boat in a storm, afraid for their lives. Why are you afraid? <laughs> well, because there's a storm in a night. Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Chapter 14, another boat, another storm. Peter walking on water, gets freaked out, starts to sink. Jesus reaches out his hand and grabs him. O you of little faith, why did you doubt? Chapter 16, again, about now the subject of material provision. Oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Notice, by the way, the need for some teachings to be repeated. You see that? Two times physical security and with fear, two times material provision, stuff's got to be repeated. So let me repeat what I said in chapter eight when it comes to these two words, little faith. What I said then, and I say now, is what Jesus is addressing with his disciples. It's not that the disciples have no faith. They are not the faithless. He, they have faith. It's just that their faith is little. And that is a description of those who have genuine faith, but they are limited in their awareness of the power of Jesus. Did you hear that? They're limited in awareness of the power of Jesus in each of these instances of little faith. It's people who believe in Him, who are growing in their belief in Him, but limited in truly acknowledging the power of Jesus at work in their daily lives. That's what I said in chapter eight. This time I will add to that. So 
disciples who have faith, but limited in awareness of the power of Jesus and limited in their awareness of the power of Jesus available to be worked through them in faith. That's the story here. Their inability, that's what they are exasperated about. They want to help, but couldn't. So not only do disciples of Jesus have limited awareness of how His power can help us in our daily lives, they have limited awareness of how Jesus' power through them can actually push back forces of darkness in the world around them. He expected them to be able to do it, and they couldn't because of their little faith. Now I'm going to come back to that in a moment, but for now, I say this many times, but good to repeat things. When speaking of little faith, one of the mistakes that we make in circumstances like this is to place too much emphasis on on the faith part. In other words, sometimes you make the mistake of having faith in faith. What, what I mean by that is like that, that is all the power is, is in the faith and we overfocus on the faith part. But that's, if you think about it, it's a lot more new agey and esoteric. Like just believe and things will be better. Well, believe in what? Or just, you know, have hope. Hope in what? Have faith, faith in, in what? The power is not as much in the faith. The power is in Jesus that is available through faith. And I'm not, I know I can be a bit of a wordsmith dork nerd guy, like pick apart phrases. And I, I'm not trying to make people like feel insecure when they say things. I just want us to be sure what our faith is in. Because he goes on to say faith like a little mustard seed. So it's not, it's not a quantity thing. You're not supposed to walk out of here with a sense of do I have enough faith? Like, do I have the right amount, like a measurement of faith? Like, do I have enough quanticles of faith? That's how you measure faith, by the way. That's the unit of measurements, a quantical. And there's a device called a quantical analyzer that analyzes how much faith you have. We have one like up there and it's scanning you all. And we find out, man, that's the guy with the faith that we're gonna make and use. I'm, I'm so glad you know that I'm joking because of course that's not the point. It's never about the intensity of what we are, or the confidence, it's purely what we're, our focus here is on Jesus and His power, but that is available through faith. I'll give you another example of a, of a phrase we use, and I've used many times, and again, I really don't want you to be insecure about saying these things, but we say prayer is powerful. And I bring that up because if you're familiar with this story, you may be familiar with its parallel in Mark chapter nine, where Mark records Jesus saying at the end, not Matthew, but Mark does Jesus saying, this kind, this demon, this kind can only be removed through prayer. And so that, that's in view, not in, in Matthew's account, but sometimes we will say things like prayer is powerful. And of course I know what people mean. I know what I mean when I say that, but technically speaking, it's not prayer that's powerful. Like that's more like magician speak, like incantations, you know? It's not prayer that's powerful. Jesus is powerful, but His powerful is available to us through prayer, which is an expression of faith. That's what prayer is. This is purely an expression of faith in the person of Jesus in which there is power. And so it's not just believe, it's belief in Jesus that's powerful. It's this living connection to Jesus and the contact point is faith that unleashes power in our lives and the lives of others through us. So the disciples' inability here, they wanted to help, they couldn't. And the inability is, is either on those levels of limited awareness of the power of Jesus, so they maybe weren't sure that, you know, that the kingdom of heaven could prevail here. Unlikely, you know, but maybe because Jesus is on a mountain, he's not around they just were like, I'm not sure. More likely is just the sense of this active connection through faith with Jesus and His power. Maybe what had happened is they were just trying to do it on their own, in their own strength, not literally thinking about the power of Jesus that is available to them through faith. Whatever, whatever was going on in their minds, there was not this active connection to Jesus, the Son of God, through faith, which we're learning in the story is unlimited. Unlimited in, in what it can accomplish. And in which we get to the point in the story where there's often a lot of silliness when it comes to implications of this passage. 
right, where we have this marvelous image of Jesus going this high mountain, like you've with enough faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you can, you can move it. And so some of the silly interpretations are disciples perhaps today thinking, man, that means I can start an, a, you know, a landscaping business without any overheads. I do not need to buy earth moving equipment because I can rearrange the topography of the land with the power of my mind. So sometimes it's like silliness here. I mean, God, you don't ever see God or Jesus just rearranging the topography of the landscape. You don't need a miracle to do that. You can use earth moving equipment. The impossible here, nothing will be impossible for you must be interpreted as nothing that Jesus has given you authority to do like push back the forces of darkness. He had given the disciples that authority. That's chapter 10. Nothing that he has given you the authority to do that he has called you to do for his kingdom will lack power when faith is active. And therefore all of the things that he calls us to do, he will empower us to do. And the takeaway here, and again, I know there's so many takeaways today, different stories, different things. May the Holy Spirit apply to whom it needs to apply. But I need to say this, much is not accomplished for the kingdom. That's what the story is about. Something it should be, it wasn't. Much is not accomplished for the kingdom because we simply either don't believe God will adequately empower us to do it or because we undertake these activities in our own strength. And so much is not done that could be done if we believe in the power that he will give us to do what he's called us to do and to relinquish over depending on ourselves and our own strength. I mean, as I was saying that, it's like, that's my life, but I'm sure that's a lot of yours as well. So there's a lot to be reminded of uh, when it comes to faith. Remember at the beginning of the year, that's part of why I did that little thing on faith, knowing so much would come up in Matthew about faith, different aspects of faith. So here in the story, saving faith, literally faithless suddenly believing Jesus is the Savior, the Son of God. But then also there's that aspect of living by faith and trusting God. The next little story, the really weird story, surprisingly, comes back to believing faith. That's right, a story about tax and a very valuable fish has an element that is really central to faith to it. So let's go there. That second story is a story that's unique to Matthew. So none of the other gospel writers record it. He's the only one. Maybe because it's a story about tax and Matthew is a tax collector. This is like, hey, this is my industry. This is my deal. I love this story. However, this is not a story. This tax story is not a story about Roman taxation where the Romans were taxing Israel. Matthew was a tax collector on behalf of Rome. This story is not a Roman taxation story. It's a temple tax. Specifically, it's mentioned this is a temple tax. So collected by members of the religious establishment who collected this tax that went to the upkeep of the temple and the provision for like the sacrifices that would take place. It is different to the tithe. This is like a once-off annual levy, if you like, that went towards the temple. So it's a distinctly Jewish tax that every male over 20 years old had to pay once a year, an amount of half a shekel. That's still the currency they use in Israel today. But at that time, the smaller part of the shekel, like rands and cents, was the drachma. So four drachmas was one shekel. So every male had to pay half a shekel. That's two drachmas, which was about two days wages. That's the situation in view in the story, the temple tax. So temple tax collectors come to Peter and ask Peter whether Jesus pays his taxes to the temple. To which Peter says, yes. No clue if he actually knew. He's like, I got, I got Jesus' back here. Like, yeah, of course. And that's the end of that. They go away. We don't see them again until Peter goes back into the house. And Jesus, who's been in the house all along, and Matthew, I just love how he gives us a little detail, says Jesus spoke first saying, what do you think, Simon, about this text thing? So like he's the supernatural hearing. He wasn't there. But he like, he's like the whole thing. He says, talk to me, Simon. What do you think? From whom do kings of the earth so a hypothetical situation, from whom do kings of the earth take toll 
or tax from their sons or from others. So it's a little, what do you call it? Like a little test, a little question, yeah? And the obvious answer, which Peter gets correct for once, it's the right answer. But like there were only two options. Like it is a king tax. It's children or the subjects of the kingdom. So, you know, but we'll give him credit. He still, he gives the, he gives the right answer. And he says, kings don't tax their family. They don't tax their sons. They tax their subjects. Which is, I mean, I just found this out in preparing for this, that even in the UK, the queen or the monarchy never paid taxes to England until 1992, when Queen Elizabeth, I think it was, volunteered to pay taxes, and now the monarchy has paid taxes ever since. And all other monarchy are like, man, if Queen Elizabeth had just kept quiet, we wouldn't have to pay our taxes. But that, that's exactly the hypothetical question Jesus is posing here, because the, the, the way that it works is that the king, kingdom belongs to the king, and so the family of the king don't owe him anything. They don't pay for it. Only the subjects do. So that's what Peter says. No, the, the sons don't pay taxes. The subjects do. And Jesus says, I mean, he answers correctly, yes, and then the sons are free. Now, in this little story, I mean, I must tell you, like in preparing through Matthew and outlining it, this seemed like a weird story at a weird place. But in studying Matthew, I've come to realize, as I'm sure you have too, that Matthew's super deliberate about where he puts stories, where he organizes them. His gospel is not arranged chronologically. So he very deliberately arranges stories in certain ways. And so just think here, you've got this little temple tax situation. And when Jesus engages with it, he introduces it by a little parable about a king and his sons. And then Jesus ends the story with, then the sons are free. Could that be a connection to what just happened on the mountain, which was a very obvious verification of Jesus as the son of God? Right, the voice from heaven, this is my beloved son. Is there a connection here? Sure is. So, I mean, if you think this through, this tax concerns the temple. Jesus has already made some statements about his relationship to the temple. Matthew chapter 12. He says, I tell you something greater than the temple is here. So we went through that story. What does he mean? Well, what's becoming clear now in this story is just think about it, the temple is God's, right? I mean, he is worshiped in it. In fact, his presence dwelled in the Holy of Holies in the temple. So the temple belongs to God. Jesus is God's son. That's what we just learned in the passage before. And so therefore Jesus does not owe tax for the temple any more than the son of a king owes taxes to the king for the kingdom. You with me? This is another statement, a confirmation of Jesus as God's son. The temple's about God. I'm his son. I don't owe any taxes. That's true. That's one layer, confirmation. Jesus is the son of God. But another layer is how Jesus chooses to still pay the tax, despite not needing to. He's clarified. Don't need to do this. But he chooses to do it to not cause offense. Now, again, you've been studying Matthew like, when has Jesus really been concerned about causing offense to the religious establishments? Right, but here, this, this is not one that he's gonna fight. And there's a lot to say about responsible use of Christian freedom that we're not gonna deal with today. This causing offense phrase comes up a lot in the next big teaching, which we get into next week. So we'll come back to that. But he pays the tax that he doesn't need to pay, but he pays it through miraculous means, Right? Not from his own funds. They didn't have funds. Judas was the one who ran them. It's not like they'd run out, I don't think. Just he pays it through miraculous means. Which brings us to the third layer. Where I do want to spend what little time we have left going into. The third layer. This is a multi-layered story. Again, the question that has really bugged me about the story is why does Matthew include it here? So for sure there's a throwback to the Son of God thing. There's an introduction of this offense, which we're going to get to in a few weeks. But why deliberately after the second prediction of his death and resurrection? Like as much as I could make those connections, why? He's specifically, in Jesus speaking about his death, is there some connection in this story to the death of Jesus? Turns out, yes. But to get to that layer, you've got to go right back to the origin story of this temple tax. 
So I explained to you what it is. Every male over 20, half a shekel, the whole deal. I only know that because it's in Scripture. It's one of the commandments from Exodus chapter 30. You betcha. We're going to go back and read it. Exodus chapter 30, just to remind you. Exodus, grand narrative about deliverance from Egypt. Then they're at Sinai, and there's chapter after chapter after chapter of covenants and commandments. Five of them, 25 to 36 of them, is all about the construction of the tabernacle or what the priest should wear. And then you get this little bit in the commandments about the tabernacle, the temple. So listen to this, verse 11 to 16. This is the origin of the temple tax situation. The Lord said to Moses, when you take the census of the people of Israel, then each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord when you number them, that there be no plague among them when you number them. Now, you may be thinking, David gives a census plague. Correct. Each one who's numbered in the census shall give this. So we've read, shall give a ransom. So here's what you shall give, half a shekel, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Half a shekel must be given as an offering to the Lord. Everyone who's numbered in the census, which are those males from 20 years old and upward, shall give the Lord's offering. This part I didn't mention to you, but it says the rich shall not give more, the poor shall not give less. Everyone gives the same, half a shekel, when you give the Lord's offering to make atonement for your lives. You shall take the atonement money, so this collection, he's calling it atonement money from the people of Israel and give it, here it is, for the service of the tent of meeting, so to upkeep the temple and it may bring the people of Israel to remembrance before the Lord so as to make atonement for your lives. That is it. That's the origin story to this temple tax. So if you're reading through Matthew and you get to temple tax, like what on earth is a temple tax? I mean, if you were reading and there were hyperlinks, like little blue things, you go click and go, oh, Exodus 30. And the people listening and reading in Matthew's time would, would have known this, but we have to go back and read it. This is the origin story. And there's so much to get into there and David and census, but just did you notice anything? Did anything jump out at you when reading the description of this money? It's money, but how God describes it. He describes it firstly as a ransom money. The Lord said to Moses, when you take the census, each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord. And the word ransom there in the Hebrew here is the exact same word as translated atonement and to atone for. Three times in verse 15 to 16, it says, give this money to atone for your lives. Now that's enormously strange language when talking about tax. That is language that belongs in the sacrificial system, which is true. Leviticus 17, don't worry, we won't go there. But speaking of animal sacrifice, it says you, you know, slaughter the animals and put the blood on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. So just bear with me here. We're almost through this. Atonement is a hugely important word in Christianity. It simply means to deliver or redeem by substitute. So Christians, I mean, that's the essence of the message of Christianity is Jesus atoned for our sins he became the substitute on the cross that by his blood shed, the price has been paid so we could be saved from our sins. Can I hear a amen? That's the summary of the Christian message is ransom language, atonement language. And now we know in Matthew from the very beginning that Jesus came and the reason he was given the name Jesus is he will save his people from their sins, right? We've known it all along. What we haven't known is how Jesus will save his people from their sins haven't been told. I know you know, but we haven't been told. How? We know that he must die. That's become clear from two weeks ago. But even then, we've known how his death means we'll be saved from our sins. The next clue really in Matthew, where it becomes a little clearer as how the death will mean paying for our sins, is chapter 20. So a few weeks time, we'll read this even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Give his life to die, there it is, die as a ransom. And by the way, right after that comes the whole passion narrative of Palm Sunday and his death. So maybe this is what it comes down to. This is in my mind. I'm not the only one to think this, but to be honest, it's not super common, but let me try it out on you all. Just here's what I think. Matthew, being the tax guy, 
the finance guy, comes across this story and, well, places the story just after the prediction of Jesus' death, knowing that we would click back to Exodus 30 and see this atonement word come up, then see in this story Jesus paying the atonement money on behalf of others as well. And maybe in Matthew's mind, it's an introduction to the idea that his death will be an atonement. Maybe. What do you think? Possible to know? Maybe one day we'll ask Matthew, but Jesus' atonement is true. It's true. A substitute has been made so that we can be cousins, can be paid for, and we can be saved from our sins. And that substitute is Jesus, the Son of God. And it means we're free. The sons are free because of the miraculous provision of the Son of God. What we left with is, do you believe it? And I'm just going right back to faithless and twisted generation. With all this overwhelming evidence or stories, how wonderful is the Bible? Maybe today is the day some who have been faithless take up faith in Jesus, but for the rest of us, for this faith to be consolidated in an everyday reality in our lives. Do you want that? I do. Let's pray. God, I do pray that by your mercy, through your spirit, and through your word, not mine, but your word, those who've yet to declare or realize or activate faith in you, activate faith in your son and be restored to a right relationship with you, that you would do that work in hearts this morning. May this be the day for one or some, with a faithless, take up faith in your Jesus, the Son of God, and experience the relief of atonement, freedom, and walk afresh following Jesus, the Son of God. For the rest of us, I pray, as, as we've prayed earlier in the service, that Christ fill our minds and our hearts, our daily reality, that we walk in the assurance of the freedom that we have, but that that motivate us to live not faithless and twisted lives, but lives that follow you authentically. So activate great faith. Where we have had little faith, either through anxieties in our daily lives or through inability, to act on your behalf in powerful ways. Forgive us and increase our faith. As we pray, church, I'm just reminded of the words in Mark's gospel. The Father says, I believe, but help my unbelief. Maybe that's some of us here today. Genuine belief in Jesus, but not fully living by, either trusting or operating in according to his kingdom in the ways that he's called us. But God, we acknowledge that. We believe, help our unbelief. We pray this in the name of your son. Amen.